So in just a moment, we're going to jump into our conversation about the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the field of Jewish arts and culture. But before we do, I wanted to just give you a quick um, history and context on Canvas. So it was an open space breakfast at uh, the JFN conference in Miami six years ago when I sat down at a table with Lou Cove, who is the senior advisor to the Grinspoon Foundation and who I'll introduce momentarily. Lou had invited a conversation on Jewish arts and culture and the lack, discussion of a, the lack of coordinated and sustained funding on the field. Sitting at the table discussing education technology at the next table was Rachel Levin for the Righteous Persons Foundation, who we could see was trying to keep track of the conversation at both tables. So we had a brief conversation morning, but we agreed to continue it with Rachel and with her, co with her colleague, Shana Tribwasser, who others, um, sorry, and any others who are interested in the conversation. Um, and luckily, Shane is with us today as well. So fast forward to today, with the initial support of the Righteous Person Foundation and the commitment of JFN to help bring this project to fruition, we mapped the field in two reports, both of which can be found on the JFN website and on the new Canvas website. We brought to the table generous and committed group, a generous and committed group of founding funders and an extraordinarily talented advisory board made up of artists, writers, performers, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, um, and more. And just two weeks ago, we made our very first grants. Um, so you are going to meet some of our funders this evening. Um, our, sorry, this morning, um, our advisor, some of our advisory committee members and grantees. And you'll have an opportunity to hear more in just a second from our founder and executive director. But before I do that, I just want to acknowledge and really express our gratitude to our funding partners, who are the Righteous Persons Foundation, the Klarman Family Foundation, the Jim Joseph Foundation, the Sherman Family Foundation, and the Pella Fund. So that's just a little bit of background. Um, and I wanna introduce you now to Lou Cove. And as I mentioned, Lou is the founder of Canvas, who took his passion for the arts and the spark of an idea, put us on track and carried us past the finish line. Lou is a senior advisor to the Grinspoon Foundation, an accomplished writer. He was the executive director of Reboot and the vice president of the National Yiddish Book Center. He is my friend and my colleague and a true mensch, and it is my honor to introduce Lou Cove. So appreciate that introduction. So appreciate the walk down memory lane. Um, that was a memorable morning in Miami. And we, uh, I, I can't say that we have crossed the finish line, but we've definitely crossed the starting line. <laughs> uh, and things are, are really happening now, and it's really exciting. Uh, we'll be able to share a bit of that with all of you today. Uh, I'm very grateful that folks have taken a little time out to tune in today. First of all, I just want to say to everyone on this call, I hope you are all safe and secure and with your families and that everyone uh, is, is holding up under these extraordinary conditions. Um, there is a, a saying in Yiddish, I've been putting it at the end of all my emails lately. I used to use it a lot and then I, uh, the saying is, Zeit mir alle gesund und stark. And it means, uh, it actually means, for me, stay healthy and strong. Um, and it's a nice sentiment to share with folks today. I, I feel it for all of you. So it's the most important thing right now. Um, we're going to begin this uh, presentation with some raw data and some hard numbers and some concrete ideas for making a difference in an incredibly difficult time. Um, but we also really value the creativity uh, that, that we're so dedicated to. So we're gonna make sure to have uh, a sample of some great art and creativity at the end of this presentation. But between now and then, we're gonna hear from people uh, in the field who are seeing firsthand just how devastating this crisis has been on the creative community. But also, I'm gonna try and draw the connections to you about just how dependent we all are on the creative community right now in a time of crisis. Um, so uh, let's get started. I'm gonna share my screen with you and um, 
So I want to talk about mutual support in a time of COVID. Um, I, I will just briefly explain this concept of, of Canvas, um, which, which Sibia gave you a, a quick insight into. Um, the, the precipitating factor here really was the demise of the Foundation for Jewish Culture a number of years ago. Um, while that wasn't you know, the only institution dedicated to supporting Jewish arts and culture, it was one of the primary ones and it represented a, a sort of turning of the tides that we were seeing uh, in the beginning of the 21st century, uh, a, a turning away from institutional support of Jewish arts and culture. Um, that got these conversations started in that small group in Miami uh, through many uh, different closed and open meetings that Jewish Funders Network has graciously sponsored for us across the country, both with funders and with creatives and artists in the community. Uh, it resulted in the two reports which Sibia just mentioned and, and which we'll share with you a, a link for that shortly. Um, and it also um, led us to last year's Jewish Funders Network where we all sat together around the table. When I say all, the, the, those folks who would ultimately become partners in Canvas. And we committed ourselves to A, a vision of a 21st century Jewish cultural renaissance and also to a mission, which was to elevate the ecosystem of Jewish arts and culture. And we had some thoughts about what that ecosystem would look like. Canvas is intended to be a strategic, coordinated partnership. And right now, this partnership is between the Jewish Funders Network, the Jim Joseph Foundation, the Klarman Family Foundation, the Pella Fund, the Righteous Persons Foundation, and the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation. But this is an open fund and we invite any and all Jewish Funders Network partners or, or other funders that are interested to join us in this endeavor. Um, who are we here to help? We're here to help Jewish arts and culture networks, distribution channels, and media coverage of their work. Um, this is what we mean when we say the Jewish arts and culture ecosystem. We consider these aspects to be the backbone of Jewish arts and culture. Networks, because when we make a grant to a network, we're supporting a whole array of artists in one fell swoop. This is what we would call a one-to-many investment. Um, when we support distribution channels, those might be secular distribution channels like Sundance. They could be Jewish distribution channels like uh, the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival or the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. It could be, um, uh, it could be a JCC, it could be Art Basel. There are so many ways, and I'm not even, you know, not to mention all the online ways in which we distribute great Jewish arts and culture. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, media coverage, because if, if no one's hearing about this work, then, and, then no one's seeing it, and it's not making it the audiences that it's intended for. So th these are the three areas that we identified as areas of philanthropic investment in, uh, in our effort to elevate the uh, Jewish arts and, e and culture ecosystem. Uh, I'm pleased to announce today our first round of grants. Uh, this is the first time these are being announced publicly. We uh, have committed to $736,000 to five networks. This is our first grant cycle, the network grant cycle. And the five networks that we've made grants to are Asylum Arts, the Council of Jewish Museums, the Jewish Book Council, LABA, which is a project of the 14th Street Y and the Educational Alliance, and Reboot. I want to just say that's how, that's how we intended to help artists before any of this uh, COVID stuff had begun. Uh, and we were just finalizing these grants two weeks ago. And even between then and now, some things have changed. But before I get into how else we intend to be helpful in this moment, I want to remind us all of how artists help us. Artists in this moment in particular are entertaining us. They're distracting us. They're capturing this moment for us. They're empathizing, educating, and reflecting and commiserating for us. They are opening our hearts connecting us to beauty, helping us to process these difficult times, reminding us to smile, helping us to cry, capturing the Jewish essence 
and ultimately helping us to repair the world. This is very consistent with all of our philanthropic uh, priorities and instincts, but it's also just essential to a healthy uh, and whole community. This is why artists need our help in this particular moment. Artists needed our help before this moment, but now they need our help more than ever. And I'm gonna give you some quick examples of this. First of all, world any longer to support artists. There is no National Endowment for the Humanities or National Endowment of the Arts for the Jewish community. There is no longer a foundation for Jewish culture. Uh, there are no regional cultural councils. The Massachusetts Cultural Council is a great uh, initiative and, and organization based here in Massachusetts where I live. They last week conducted a survey of their uh, cultural members. They, uh, in one week, got 566 nonprofit cultural organizations to report back and inform them of a loss, <clears throat> excuse me, of more than $55.7 million in revenue. This was not a projection. This was actual lost income reported to date. That's just in Massachusetts alone. And Massachusetts is the 15th most populous state. So you can imagine how this is being amplified across the country right now. <clears throat> Those findings also found 88% of organizations reporting canceling programs and events, totaling 14,978 cancellations. 58% of those organizations plan on laying off, furloughing, or reducing hours for staff. Um, this is happening right now. What does that look like in Massachusetts? 8,221 jobs impacted, and artists are going to be the hardest hit. If you can see the graphic on the screen, this shows independent contractors, part-time organization staff, full-time organization staff. Artists make up 70% of that pie, uh, of the percentage of people who will experience layoffs, furloughs, or reduced hours by category. We'll hear more from uh, folks in a minute about how that's playing out. Uh, some have compared this to 9-11, some have compared this to the recession, the Great Recession of 2008. I want to I suggest that this time is very, very different. Demand in those times dropped. This time it didn't drop, it's completely evaporated. Uh, force majeure is being invoked by organizations forcing artists to not only lose contracts, but in many cases be asked to return deposits that they uh, had been made significant loss, layoffs are imminent beyond what we just looked at for a single commonwealth. Many arts organizations are self-insured, which means that if they lay off their employees, the cost burden to them is much greater than it would be otherwise. And the foundation world simply isn't going to be large enough to solve this whole problem. We are going to need to rely on the federal government as well and find ways uh, to lobby our, our legislators to get support for the creative community. The long-term outlook is that the landscape will indeed change. There will be major losses in this environment, losses of cultural institutions, performers and artists who can no longer do their work. Uh, it's going to be significant and it's going to be very real. The Canvas response to this, um, in, in a very short time, we got a very quick consensus to create something called the Fund for Creation. Canvas will be releasing an additional $180,000 in emergency funds specifically earmarked for Jewish creatives. This will be, uh, these, will, these funds will be distributed by our five network grantees. Um, and uh, we feel that they're best positioned to identify those in need and also to put people back to work. Um, we're being very flexible with how the funds can, can be allocated. The, the main requirement is that they go directly into the hands of working creatives who have been economically impacted by the crisis. Um, this fund for creation went live last night. Uh, this is now, there's now a donate page uh, available that you can link to from our website, www.bycanvas.org, or if you're a foundation professional uh, or, or it would otherwise uh, like to just speak with us directly, 
about how to get involved, you can speak with me or speak with Sivia. That's what we're doing. We invite you to join us, but we also invite you to emulate what we're doing. And we invite you to elevate the ecosystem in your own communities because they're going to need it. Um, so let's hear who the people on the front lines are and how they are uh, either absorbing, observing, or rising to the occasion of this particular impact. Uh, so I'd like to first introduce Naomi Firestone Teeter, who is the Executive Director of the Jewish Book Council. The Jewish Book Council is an incredible organization that has a huge membership of both presenting organizations in the form of JCCs and other Jewish organizations that bring great Jewish culture to mass audiences, but also overseeing a massive network of authors that have, have found huge uh, audiences, success, uh, and otherwise. And I will just tell you as a published author uh, who published with a mainstream press, my publisher said to me, we're, we're going to pay the fee to get you into Jewish Book Council's uh, presentation because we know that they can make the difference. They can make or break a book for an author. That's just how influential this organization is. The organization was, uh, found, was most recently started by Carolyn Starman Hessel. She was a powerful force in the field. She handed over the leadership reins to Naomi, who's done just an outstanding job of taking the uh, Jewish Book Council to the next level, introduced a new publication. I could say so much more, but Naomi, I was hoping you could share with folks what you're seeing on the ground and how this current health crisis is impacting the field. Um, just to give you, Lou gave you a little overview of JBC. I'm going to give you a two second additional inter, uh, overview and then I'll go into some details. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Jewish Book Council, our mission is to enrich and educate the community through Jewish literature. Um, we work with over 250 authors a year to try to get them on tour into Jewish communities across North America. We work with about 130 Jewish arts presenters. These are JCC, synagogues, national organizations, federations, etc. Every May, where each author pitches their book for two minutes, and this program ends up resulting in about 1,300 events uh, every year. We're also going into our 70th year of giving out the National Jewish Book Awards. We publish a print literary journal called Paper Brigade. We publish new content on our website, reviews, essays, interviews, etc. every week, and we work with over 2,000 book clubs to provide resources. And what we're seeing on the ground that's affecting our authors um, is Immediately, our authors who have books out right now, their entire tours are canceled. Um, so these are authors who have had books out in February, as well as March, April, May, and even looking into June now. So all of those events they had scheduled all over um, the country, around North America, um, have been eliminated. Their bookstore visits have been eliminated. Um, and we're start, we, we coach them for the two minutes for the conference that we were supposed to have in May, which we're adjusting, obviously, right now. And they're telling us that they feel like their book is going to be dead in the water, that JBC is their last hope right now to save their book. Um, and that by the time this is over, their book will be old and totally ignored. And they've been working on this book for two years, five years, 10 years. This is their life's work. And this was their moment to get that work out into the world. And they feel like that opportunity um, might be lost now. Um, additionally, for all of our authors, um, but especially the authors who have books out right now, their lifestyle pieces have been which means a lot of their exposure has been canceled um, and also ability to reach readers, but also freelance money that they rely on for their income. Um, our publications, not ours, but publications across the board are hesitant about what readers actually want to read right now. They're concerned with their own cash flow and budgets. They're delaying payments. Um, we may turn the corner a little on this one, depending on how things proceed, but it's unclear right now. For many of our authors, writing is not their day job. That's not how they make most of their income. They have day jobs. They are, um, they're lecturing, they're teaching, they're waiting tables, they're scraping together a living in various ways. And those jobs have now been either frozen or lost. They're struggling to pay their rent, they pay their bills, they have no health insurance. Um, some of them have previously been able to um, give back to the Jewish community and offer a lot of events for free to our sites. And that's becoming a much bigger ask um, at this moment when their financial resources have become incredibly strained. On the other side with the arts presenters, we're concerned they're closing their doors. 
they're closing the rivers right now. They're regrouping. They're trying to figure out what their, you know, spring looks like, summer looks like, what their fall and looking into 2021 looks like, and where arts and culture is going to fit into that programming. So while our authors right now with the spring releases are telling us how concerned they are, our authors in the fall and spring next year may be equally affected depending on what their ability is going to be to actually host authors, whether it's physical, whether it's virtual. Um, we're trying to listen to them every day. We're doing town halls with them to get a better sense of what their programming might look like in the future and how we can get authors out into the community and help them sell books. Um, we're seeing a lot of fulfillment issues, getting books out from bookstores and publishers. We're seeing distribution channels close, book printing, um, has been paused um, for some publishers. We're seeing in just the past two, three days, publishers are emailing us that they're moving pub dates. Um, books that were coming out in May, June, July are now moving to 2021, which you know we'll see what the impact is later when we have you know more books we're gonna need to promote and get out there and, and sell um, all at the same time when everyone is trying to do that. Um, Amazon, where about 50% of book buying occurs has deprioritized book sales. So at the beginning of this, everyone's like, okay, we're going to buy books. We're going to keep that. We're going to keep that coming. Um, but now they've deprioritized the sales. And I just got an email about 30 minutes ago, one of the publisher updates that book sales in general are dropping um, across the board. Um, so just to sum up that piece of it, we're seeing a loss of income connected to book sales, their day jobs, freelance opportunities. Authors right now are, who have books set, coming out this moment are losing exposure opportunities. Um, they're losing all of their spring events and their entire book tour basically, um, and just limiting their overall exposure. So what is JVC doing? Um, right away, we launched, um, just very simply on our website, a Jewish literary um, conversations and quarantine page, which we are updating on a regular basis with events that authors are offering, workshops, book clubs, what our communities are starting to do um, to create a cultural, a Jewish cultural environment at this moment. Um, we're creating virtual events with partners like the Jewish Museum here in New York, with Lee Mood, with AJHS. We're trying to push digital book sales, e-downloads, audio sales. We hosted our first event last week and we're trying to get to the point where we're doing one virtual event a week. And we're talking to a lot of new partners at the moment. who are also trying to do the same thing. Our readers and authors respond very well to poetry in times of crisis. And it's also now Poetry Month. So we've added a virtual poetry reading series to our Instagram and Facebook story accounts. And we've been receiving a very positive response from our readers and also authors who have written poetry or not written poetry, who are asking if they can participate, if they can contribute something, if they can read. Um, we're gonna do one week devoted to translation coming up because we've had a lot of requests for that. Um, we've moved the network conference that I mentioned earlier. We're turning it into a virtual conference online over three or four days um, where we're going to have live author pitches, live author pitches. We're going to do workshops for our arts presenters. Um, but at the moment, we're rethinking the timeline of that. For the publishers and authors, they're excited and thrilled that we're adapting to that space. But our arts presenters are now like, hey, hang on, we're not sure when we're going to be able to actually do this programming. Can we come to this conference even in June virtually? Uh, we're just we're just not sure what our situation is going to look like. So we're continuing to speak to them and renegotiate what that is going to look like so that our authors have a place to actually go um, come the fall. Um, we're increasing our digital content. We're asking writers to contribute new pieces for our website, for PB Daily. We're pivoting current series to digital space and adding virtual new virtual events. Um, a lot of our authors would contribute something um, for no charge around the time their book is coming out to help promote it. That's becoming a very difficult ask of us. Um, so anyway, just to kind of sum up here, we're adding more digital content. We're trying to think of new partnership ideas, but the landscape is also getting very crowded. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we continue to make a mark and continue to support authors, book sales, put money into their pockets and support our arts presenters as well. Thanks, Naomi. Um, we're really proud to be supporting the Jewish Book Council in this work. Um, we know how hard you are all working uh, and we see the productivity that's coming through the site. I wanna encourage everybody to go to the Jewish Book Council site. There's so much content there and everybody's got a little extra time to read right now. There are plenty of recommendations. So go there, um, take their recommendations, buy eBooks if you don't wanna, or you can't order books online. <clears throat> but um, support those authors. Okay, I want to hand it over now to Ben Gundersheimer, also known as Mr. G, although for 
up until just a minute ago, he was known as Lou Cove on this conference. I don't know. Hey, I, I don't know how we did that. I apologize, Ben, but I'm glad we got your name there. Um, ben is a uh, an amazing musician, performer, Latin Grammy winner, multilingual recording artist, uh, and now also multi-published author with Penguin Random House. Um, he performs under the name Mr. G. Uh, he has performed everywhere from your local JCC to Lollapalooza and Austin City Limits. Um, he is a member of the Canvas Advisory Council, um, and he's really on the front lines of, of the conversation that we're having today. So, uh, Ben, thanks for joining us today, and, and thanks for sharing a little bit of your perspective. Thanks, Lou. Good to be with you all. First, I, I just want to take a, a moment and applaud Lou and Sivia and everyone from Canvas who's pivoting to address the, frankly, just like the rampant unemployment that artists like myself suddenly find ourselves in. Um, just to give an example of my personal story just from the last couple of weeks, um, picking up on what Naomi said, I had a book that just came out called Lila Tove Goodnight, a, bilingual Hebrew English book. Uh, I was going to be performing at the Jewish Funders Network and the day before was going to be giving a reading and a concert in Miami. Um, this weekend I was going to be playing the big concert in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And I just went from being a busy artist who was happily touring the world playing concerts and uh, also now doing book readings to being unemployed. Um, I have no income. And that is not, of course, unique to me in any case whatsoever. It's, it's um, an emergency that's faced by artists uh, worldwide. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible shock um, to those of us who've worked so hard to develop these careers and just have that just wiped away. Uh, and frankly, for someone like myself who's in the business of bringing people together to have these joyful real-time experiences, communal experiences of listening to music, reading books. Um, I don't know when and if that will return. I, I don't, I'm not optimistic uh, that we'll get back to that for years. And when we do, I don't know how the landscape will look, but it can't look the same in terms of the budgets that have existed to enable someone like me to do the work that I do. Um, so in terms of how I've responded to it, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I have, among other things, uh, become a fundraiser um, and created something called Mr. G TV, which we're launching this week. Um, and it is a video online concert series from my recording studio, but also uh, uh, and, and a multi-camera professionally shot and edited series. But we're also going to be working with remotely uh, prominent musicians, authors, activists from all over the world. So what I've done is put my team back to work. So I'm hiring uh, editors, videographers, other musicians, and I'm doing it on faith that the funding community will respond to, as Lou so well articulated, the need, the, the role that artists play in society in general, but particularly in a moment like now. Uh, so the first thing that we did, I, I wrote a song the other day, just learning like all of us about washing your hands. And, and to those of you who aren't familiar with my work, I work primarily with children and families. And so the notion of washing your hands, of course, has become anxiety provoking to say the least. And so I, can, I wanted to turn that and transform that moment into something funky and fun. So in my, on my own in my studio, I just came up with an idea like, everyone across the land, we're all together washing our hands. Everyone across the land. Started working that up in my studio with guitars and claps and by myself and uh, kind of was feeling lonely because we're all isolated. So I started reaching out to musician friends and collaborators around the world. And um, happily, and we've documented this with uh, uh, this link that Lou is sharing with you, um, an invitation now for the wide world to, to crowdsource a video for this song. So if you check out mrg.tv um, 
uh, you'll see this video that we created and you'll see the collaboration that's happening internationally with other musicians and children. And now we're going to uh, launch this on the weekend and um, crowdsource a video and try to build this up to be a source of entertainment and education and inspiration for the countless millions of uh, children and families stuck at home. So what you'll see here is um, a broad appeal to the wide world. Uh, there's a version in English and a version in Spanish, but what I'm interested in doing is creating a weekly Shabbat series. I've uh, released several albums with PJ Library and they'll also be distributing this book. Um, and so we'd like to have a Shabbat series similarly with uh, prominent musicians from around the world and rabbis. Um, but it's going to take funding and frankly i don't know if we can get it so i'm going to appeal to all of you to recognize that that type of work is valuable and hopefully we can get it off the ground and contribute something meaningful to to people thanks ben um it's particularly difficult for musicians i just want to say who are already dealing with uh, a totally different economic challenge having to do with the fact that no one buys cds or albums anymore yeah. and so they're all depending on live performances because right. selling recordings doesn't work anymore absolutely okay i'm gonna keep us moving along um and i wanted to next introduce uh malka travaglini um, who is program officer at the uh, Klarman Family Foundation in Boston. Uh, Malka got involved with the Canvas discussion early on. The Klarman Foundation has been a big supporter of the arts in general. Um, and I think this is their, their sort of first uh, move into the Jewish arts world outside of Boston uh, or outside of Massachusetts. Um, Malka can explain in greater detail. I just want to say how much I value Malka's input in, in developing Canvas. She has an incredible sense of what arts organizations really need and what it means to build capacity for these organizations. It's been a big focus of the Klarman Foundation. Malka leads the charge on that there, and I've learned so much from her. So I'm glad you'll have a chance to learn now, too. Thank you, Lou, um, and thank you for all you've done for Canvas. I'm going to be pretty quick because I feel like a lot of themes that um, I want to mention have already been covered by um, Naomi and Ben and Lou. Um, so the Klarman Family Foundation um, supports arts and culture, the secular space in the Jewish world in several ways. We do cohort work in collaboration with other funders. So this includes Canvas and a partnership with the Bar Foundation, another Boston-based foundation to support almost 30 mid-sized arts and cultural organizations statewide. We also support in-school and out-of-school music organizations in Massachusetts, working with low-income youth. And finally, we support some Jewish and non-Jewish organizations in Boston in an effort to create a more vibrant city like Shakespeare on the Common or the Jewish Arts Collaborative. We're hearing, um, as has been mentioned, that the arts sector is struggling significantly in the current environment. There's questions around retaining staff, sustaining operations through the next, it's really till the end of the year. Um, many organizations have had to cancel performances and fundraising events planned for the spring. They've had to close facilities. They've seen a drop both in earned revenue and they're anticipating um, a decrease in contributed revenue. And many do not have significant reserves to rely on. And they're having to lay off staff as all this is happening. And the self-insurance piece that Lou mentioned um, has been really a boon or not a boot, a struggle for organizations. That, and um, until this federal stimulus bill came out, um, these employees who were gig workers were unable to access um, state unemployment benefits. For our organizations that work with youth, they're struggling to figure out how to move curriculum online to keep youth engaged, how to move your end performances and gatherings online. And many youth are facing really challenging home situations the arts education they get is their main source of support and mentorship, and teachers are struggling with how to play this role virtually. And finally, we're seeing a lot of burnout as people try to shift operations online, revise curriculum, reach out to youth and families and their constituencies. So how is the Klarman Family Foundation addressing all this? It's certainly a lot. Um, to date, we've made some initial grants um, to many of the emergency funds in Greater Boston at our um, local Community Foundation, Combined Jewish Philanthropies, United Way, and the City of Boston. 
and to support organizations serving the homeless and addressing community needs and food insecurity statewide. As we look specifically at our arts and cultural grantees, we're thinking about approaching this in a variety of ways. So for the cohort work, as Lou mentioned with Canvas, we're trying to figure out how to be responsive in real time to this current moment. There's questions around how do we design the learning agenda so that we can focus on content that will be relevant to organizations right now, such as managing finances during this period, thinking about scenario planning, should this last three months, six months, till year end, et cetera. Thinking about what's needed for sustaining core operations and right sizing organizations. And also we wanna make sure on our side that we're not putting any unnecessary restrictions on grantees. So we recognize that goal set last fall, for example, may no longer be relevant or realistic given the current situation. And we also are thinking about how to loosen up funding. So for example, with our um, partnership with the Bar Foundation, we had um, restricted some funding for technical assistance and artistic risk. And we're now thinking about how to redeploy that as emergency capital. We're thinking long-term about what will be needed, both for emergency funding and funding for um, recovery and technical assistance in the fall when these organizations will be reimagining what their core work will look like and having to right size and ramp up their operations. And finally, we're thinking about what kind of assistance is needed so that organizations can connect to public resources. So we've had a lot of questions come from grantees about the small business loans that were just announced um, and other federal programs. So what kind of consultants, lawyers, banks, et cetera, do these organizations need connect connections to to access these loans? Um, outside of cohort work, we're reaching out to individual grantees to let them know we have their back and that the foundation is committed to um, all funds and that they will be paid. Um, and we're also listening and learning from our grantees about the challenges they're facing in real time and what's keeping them up at night. And I think that information is really critical and will inform any future response from the foundation. So certainly we're also like um, all the organizations have spoken already like building um, the plane while trying to fly it. And I think it'll be, um, I think we'll have to learn a lot in the next few weeks um, and months about what will be needed to help the field. Thanks. Thanks, Malka. Um, I think this point um, about really trying to address both the short and the midterm and long-term needs is very important. There is an instinct on all of our parts to just want to help in every way possible right in this moment. We also recognize as funders in this space that we're in it for the long haul. So we're thinking carefully about how to invest wisely over time to make sure that as many of the, the, the essential organizations within the Jewish arts and culture ecosystem can survive for the long term. And they in turn, at least in our calculus with, with Canvas, they in turn, like the networks, can support other artists. Um, okay, I want to keep it moving along. I mentioned at the beginning that um, there is no real infrastructure within communities for Jewish arts and culture. Uh, there's a, a little bright spot, however, here on the eastern seaboard in Boston, where Sophie Krenzman was recently appointed as the Director of Arts and Culture at the Combined Jewish Philanthropies in Boston, uh, which is the, the Jewish Communal Fund and the, the Federation for Boston. Um, Sophie uh, and I have been in regular touch um, because I've been so excited about this development. I'm not aware of another position of a director of arts and culture at another federation in North America right now. But if anyone on this call is, please post in the, in the Zoom chat. And by the way, you can post questions there too because we will take questions in just a few minutes. Um, but I want to introduce uh, Sophie, who is, is just getting started. So it's very early to be responding to a crisis. Uh, but maybe you can just give us a quick picture of what's going on on the ground in Boston. Sure. Thanks, Lou. And thanks, everyone, for everything that you're doing. This is a very difficult moment for our entire community and for the whole country. So it is very heartening to know that so many people are responding in such a strategic way. Um, so as Lou said, my position is new at CJP. Um, I've been, I started the job in July, so we're in the process of building out this new strategy. And obviously this is a bit of a pivot point that we were not expecting. So in general, CJP has opened an emergency fund for our community and raised over 1.1 million to date. 
um, our response is multi-pronged, but is generally focusing on vulnerable populations and food insecurity, and then also how we can support the resiliency of our organizations in the community. Um, and those organizations include our arts and culture partners. So we are working with organizations in a variety of ways, both with direct relational support, helping to understand what it is that they need and how we might be able to help. And then also a series of webinars with topics like cybersecurity, how to build connection virtually, fundraising during this time and more. So um, I'm also in conversation with our arts and culture institutions. And I actually just uh, literally this morning had a great call with um, the heads or the cultural program officers for most of those institutions talking about how they've pivoted their work at the moment, um, their questions and concerns moving forward, as people have talked about how this will kind of permanently or may permanently change the landscape of the work that they do, um, and then finding ways to collaborate with one another. So for us internally, within our arts and culture framework this spring, I was able to open up a small pilot grant pool focused on supporting arts and culture in the community. Uh, which has been great just to see kind of what the need has been, what exciting projects we can help to start to support. Um, that has obviously shifted some as a lot of those events um, have been postponed or needed to shift and focus. So just like other funders have talked about, we're being as flexible as possible and really helping, um, hoping to agree as long as it makes sense to repurpose those funds in other ways, um, either to an online program or allowing them to postpone it if they need. Um, we're also currently working on some parameters for another small grant pool that um, I'm hoping to open up in the next few weeks, um, looking to kind of specifically work with our arts and culture institutions to help them with their online programming and then also to make sure that artists are getting compensated for their time. Um, I think this was mentioned earlier, but one of the biggest issues that I think we're all facing is this, um, uh, I would say, uh, this way that people feel like all online content should be free, but the reality is that artists um, need to get compensated for their time and their expertise. So we, I think as funders, have an opportunity to really step in and make sure that we can both make content available, but also make sure that people are, are paid for what they do. Um, we've also, as I said, I just want to give an example. A lot of our institutions have pivoted their work online. Um, and one really great example that's been exciting to see is the Boston Jewish Film has something called their Real Abilities Film Festival, which uh, the closing night is actually tonight. It's been happening over the last couple of weeks, and it's focused on films by and about the disabilities community. Um, and they actually have had double the amount of registrations that they had from last year. Um, they had, most films had more than 300 attendants. Um, they had people stay after for Q&As with the filmmakers. So this has been a very engaging and interesting pilot for them and they're actually thinking about potentially incorporating a virtual component into future festivals in general. Um, so this has been great learning for our community and they'll share more as they go. And then moving forward, we're currently mapping out what the offerings are in our community, where there might be gaps we can help to fill, what we can support. Um, and I'm also going to be working on pulling an artist council together to really think about what the artist needs are in our community and then how we can really lead through art and help um, develop creative solutions for our community to move through and in this crisis because this is as people have said this is not ending next week this is going to have long-term ramifications and we want to make sure arts and culture is a part of that response i'm so excited that this is going on and i hope um, for those that are that are on the webinar you'll you'll encourage your local federations or communal funds to take a look at what Boston is doing um, and consider emulating that. One of the goals of Canvas is to increase the overall investment in Jewish arts and culture. That doesn't mean that it's just what Canvas is doing. It means we just want to see that it becomes a bigger part of, of overall portfolios for, for everyone within the Jewish philanthropic world. So, that is a very uh, real and, and material way to do something right in your own backyard. Um, and I'm so encouraged to hear about that film festival. Um, that is really exciting in a, in a dark time. <laughs> That's a ray of light. Okay. Um, I, I want to introduce Shana Rose Trebwasser, who uh, is at the Righteous Persons Foundation and has been my uh, partner along with Sivia really from the very beginning in all of this. 
Um, Righteous Persons Foundation has been a leader in investing in Jewish arts and culture, um, an inspiration for so many of us, uh, an experienced funder who that really understands what the field looks like, what the field needs, and, and how to invest wisely in this space. There's so much experience there. Um, and Shana has been uh, just an incredible guide for me in, in developing the Canvas project. Um, so I want to introduce Shana to, to all of you. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining. I want to echo the sentiments of just wishing everyone health and safety and connection. Um, I've been thinking about you know that a lot today in Los Angeles. Uh, the mayor um, suggested everybody wear masks when we go outside. And so I sort of spent the first five minutes of my morning thinking about um, what it means to cover our mouths, you know, what it means to cover our faces, which is where we, um, you know, I'm thinking about Ben, like where, where you sing from um, and thinking about how that sort of takes this crisis of connection to a whole new level. So ho holding that, that wish really, really dear. Um, so Righteous Persons Foundation, as Lou mentioned, we have been looking at this issue um, for many, many years. Um, we have the fortune of having funders, not one, but two who are artists and who deeply understand the power of storytelling because they're storytellers themselves. Um, so over the years, we've invested in and supported arts and culture projects and programs um, with a particular focus on documentary film. We launched and supported a documentary film fund that was housed at the Foundation for Jewish Culture for many, many years. Um, and around 2015, um, really right before I joined the foundation, as Sivia shared at the top of the call, the foundation started to feel a sense of urgency around supporting the broader field, getting more funders in, thinking about infrastructure, thinking about coordinated and collective funding. Um, and that was long before this COVID crisis. Um, our response at that time was to invest in this effort, do some research and invite other partners to join us and really to co-design a fund that would work in real partnership with the Jewish arts and culture field. Um, we're so proud of what Canvas has started. Lou, I love the way you put it, that we you know, crossed the start, a starting line. I think that's exactly right. Um, and hearing everyone talk today um, and, you know, looking at the stats and seeing what's coming out of our grantees as well, I'm, I'm really struck by the enormity of the need um, that this culture field is going to be facing in the months and, you know, I think years ahead. Um, I've been thinking about this word essential, right? We've been talking about, like, what are essential businesses? What are, like, who are essential workers? What are our essential goods uh, that we provide? And I think one of the questions of this crisis is going to be, like, what do we as a culture hold essential? Um, and I think, you know, if we're able to lift our gaze just a little, which is one of the unique roles of philanthropy, to be able to, you know, think about what are the things that we want to ensure for, for our future, for our culture, for all to be able to access. I have a real clarity that arts and culture is absolutely essential to the world that we want to re-enter and, you know, the future that we all want to rebuild. So in thinking about that and thinking about the enormity, I think we know that we cannot do it alone, that coordinated efforts are going to be critical. I think we're, we're good in a disaster um, at coordinating really quickly. We're seeing it in, you know, in neighborhoods where uh, someone in one apartment is emailing the person next door to see what they need. We're seeing it through, you know, philanthropy with the number of response funds that have very quickly gotten up and running. Um, I think it's a good instinct and I know it's one that we're going to have to sustain. You know, Malka talked about this, um, Lou talked about this, the short-term, the mid-term, the long-term needs. And I think given the the numbers that we're seeing come out of the arts and culture field, we know that we're going to need a long-term effort that really is coordinated and helps um, leverage all of our gifts, um, you know, money and other supports, expertise, knowledge, um, 
how we, how we build capacity, um, financial expertise, distribution expertise, everything we can muster um, is gonna really be required to keep, to keep this field going and to keep artists um, at the fore so that they can do what they do best, which is keep us all connected, both in moments of crisis um, and in moments where we're all flourishing um, to help us feel and enjoy that too. So um, I'll leave it at that. I know there's questions and there's been so much wisdom already shared, but I just want to say thank you again um, in helping us lift up um, artists and arts organizations right now and always. Thank you, Shana. Okay, um, so you've heard from all of us. Uh, I'm, I so share the sentiments that Shana just um, expressed. It was lovely. Um, if there are questions from the group, please feel free to uh, share them in the, in the Zoom chat. Um, I, I guess I wanna say, number one, if you're interested in supporting Jewish arts and culture, you can join Canvas and, and partner with us. You can go to your local federation and, uh, and suggest uh, they, that they designate or designate your gift towards uh, an arts and culture initiative. Um, you can fund artists directly. Ben's given a good example. Naomi's given good examples. We can talk more about that. Um, I'm not able to see the Q&A box, I guess. So is, is anybody able to see the questions? I can, I can see it, Lou. Oh, great. Thank you. Do you mind? Sure. So, so actually, Lisa Rubin asked a good question, which is, uh, uh, is that Jewish federations are suffering and understandably are prioritizing vulnerable populations in the community and essential community needs of which art is not considered essential, despite the first slide of how artists are getting us through this time. Um, we're talking about it a bit now, but how can JFN encourage federations to not give up on the allocations to arts and culture? And I guess I should take a shot at answering that which is the first thing is doing webinars like this, like partnering with JFN, having these conversations, not only broadly with all of you who are on, but you know, we, JFN is part of a whole slew of community conversations with, with different segments of the Jewish community. And in each of those conversations, we have the opportunity to raise the issues um, around how we support all of the different elements of our community. And um, I think that we will continue to do that through our staff and through these kinds of opportunities. There's another question um, that uh, uh, Rebecca Guber is asking, do you see the first level need as the artists or the cultural institutions, Jewish museums and so on? Do you wanna answer that, Lou? Sorry, Sylvia, can you re repeat? I didn't realize the question was to me. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Do you see the first level need as the artists oh. or as or the cultural institutions, Jewish museums, et cetera? Right. So so we, you know, pre pre-COVID, the the notion was focus on the institutions that could then, you know, support the artists. Um, and and we like that approach for Canvas, but we also saw in very real time, as we've just kind of laid out for everybody, that artists themselves were, were just in need of immediate and direct support. Um, we have a great concern about institutions and, and that they are able to, to stay strong. Canvas itself and its current incarnation is, in, is not yet in any kind of position to prop them up in a way that we can prop up uh, the, the areas that I just described. Uh, certainly networks and certainly individual artists. We can get back to media coverage uh, when, when, there's, when the time is right. And I think that time will be very soon, actually, because when you hear stories like the one Sophie just told about what's going on, that's a great story to tell, um, to remind people that, that uh, art is alive and well and it's playing a vital role right now. And I love that particular case because not only is that wonderful creativity, but there's also a, a really important educational and social justice component to that particular film festival. So it just covers so many of the things we need. And to the, to the 
question that, that Lisa had posed, I'll just add, like, when we isolate these things and we sort of put arts to the side and say, inessential, and to, to Shana's point about the word essential itself, they're all kind of of a piece. And I think the, the job here is for us to figure out how we can make the connection between these, these different uh, disciplines. Uh, they help one another whether it's, you know, Ben has done this incredible video and I hope you watch it, that he's developing about just encouraging kids to wash their hands. And as a parent, I know our kids are not as good <laughs> about social distancing, about hygiene as they need to be in a moment like this, presenting it in a fun, creative, entertaining way that actually gives them a way to respond is gonna be really important in this kind of moment. Luke, can I add one thing? Oh, please. Sorry, Sophie. just yeah. really quickly on the federation yeah. question also. Um, I think I would also just encourage people as you talk to your federations and your professionals to also think about, you know, I think we, we all on the call, um, at least presenting, understand kind of the value of arts and culture as arts and culture and how it gives soul to people and meaning to people. But I think there's a whole other piece of it, which we talk about a lot at CJP, of arts and culture as a tool to enter into different conversations, to help people heal, to get through different times, to think about creative solutions. So I think um, as you're trying to encourage your federations to focus on this stuff also, it can sometimes be helpful to take that lens of saying, you know, this is an incredible tool for our community and how do we really layer that onto the responses that we're, that we're taking. Perfect, yeah. So Lou, along those, along those lines, uh, Melanie Schneider is asking a question, how is or might Canvas represent artists to Jewish institutions and organizations that are leading in offering content online at this time of COVID? We're, we're giving a lot of thought to that issue. I mean, one thing that we can do by supporting these networks, Rebecca Guber, who just uh, posed a question earlier from Asylum Arts Network represents uh, over 600 uh, international Jewish artists. Um, Reboot has, I think at this point, well over 500 creative members. The Council of American Jewish Museums uh, has a couple hundred museums. Um, we can become a sort of central clearinghouse to share that. And we are looking and are, have been in conversations with media partners about how to create a centralized database or to identify ways in which we can push out the best um, to, to the broader community. Uh, we're really focused on, I think, two things here, excellence in, in Jewish creativity and capacity to do that work. Um, and the capacity to do that work also means the capacity to share that work broadly. So we're very committed to that. It's gonna take a little bit of time because we've been a little sidetracked here, but, but that's definitely part of the plan. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I've asked Ben to just leave us with a, a quick song at the end. He showed you earlier that he's recently published a book called Lila Tov. Um, I'll, I'll share a couple of images from the screen uh, from the book, because uh, I could do that for you, Ben, but if you could just explain um, the genesis of, of the, the song in the book and, and also the artist would be great. Absolutely. Um... So this book would really originated as a song. PJ Library has commissioned me to write two albums of original Jewish themed family music. So the first one, which was called The Mitzvah Bust, Lila Tov is the last song on the album. And it's really just a, a conceived of as a lullaby, sweet sort of goodnight lullaby. Uh, the book, which is dedicated to the memory of my grandparents uh, who, we're fortunate to get out of Germany with my father who was a baby. It's really transformed into a beautiful refugee narrative by this brilliant artist, Israeli artist, Noir Lee Nagan. And um, what it's really become now is a, a story of uh, children and families saying goodnight to nature as they move towards a new land. So this is how it originated though. Been a long and beautiful day. The sun got tired and went away. The moon is rising big and bright. Now it's time to say goodnight, Lila Tov. 
לילה טוב, לילה טוב to my sister and brother, לילה טוב to my father and mother, לילה טוב to the birds and the trees, לילה טוב to the fish and the sea, לילה טוב, לילה טוב. לילה טוב, לילה טוב. Good night, good night, good night. Good night, good night, good night. We could all sing the chorus together maybe, Lou. I can't see you, but I'll... I'll feel your energy, so let's do that. La la tov. 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 Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate that. I want to thank Sophie, Malka, Shana, Naomi, Sivia, uh, and I want to thank Jewish Funders Network for making this possible. Um, that's the reason we do what we do, uh, something that can just touch you, make you smile, make you cry a little. Uh, I think we need to do all those things right now. Um, thanks to everybody who's joined on the webinar. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from you soon. Let us know how we can help and let us know if you want to help with us. We'll talk to you all soon.